Hello and welcome to The Catch Up, a collaboration between Give and Toke and Oz Canner Reviews. I'm Paul. And I'm Christina. And we come together each month to explore what's been happening in cannabis in Australia and around the world. Now you can get in touch with us by emailing giveandtoke at gmail.com or ozcannareviews at gmail.com and follow the links in the show notes below to find out more about the work we do when we're not doing this show. Christina, what's been going on for you lately? Well, I just had my big top 100 subscribers giveaway. Crazy logistics to make it happen. I don't think I'll do handwritten (laughs) thank you notes (laughs) next year, but I would say that it was a success. I, you know, they all, all but two went out because there was a little bit of a misunderstanding with those two, but they're going out here any day. And so, yeah, yay, I'm happy. It was fun. It was exciting. And Yay. <laughs> yeah, I was very grateful to receive my subscriber package. So you sent out 100 packages, lots of little treats. We got some jelly beans in there. We got some dube tubes. We got some CBD patches, some of our Oprah's favorite things, if you will. So I yes, really appreciated that. And I'm sure other people are too. That's totally where I'm going with it too. Oprah's favorite things. I'm like a girl can dream, right? Like, Yeah, I hope that when we do, uh, maybe we do a live podcast one day and everyone looks under their chairs and there's, you know, free dab rig or something like that. I love it. I love it. I'm not, yeah. God, a girl can dream, right? Like I said, I just, I, I don't know. I remember as a kid watching Oprah's favorite, like one of the first couple episodes of it. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool to be able to give away your favorite things to people and then be like so genuinely pumped to get them because zero expectation they had no idea like what was going on what was going to happen and yeah just to be able to give back to the community and you know just for being a subscriber thank you well you know i'm a white guy in my mid-30s on a podcast so i'm not going to fact check this but i do think there was some like controversy to the oprah's favorite things i think once she gave like a hundred people cars but they all had to like pay the tax on them or something but because they were so like low socioeconomic a bunch of the people didn't get cars so like i said i have not fact checked that i could be completely wrong but that kind of rings a bell for me let's not turn into that version of oprah right i mean i want to be big but i don't know if i could be oprah big so you know <laughs> dial it back just a little bit right <laughs> that's that's it. That's it. <laughs> oh man, good times. But I mean, look, if I could eventually give away an eighth of my favorite flowers to everybody, like once a year, I think that that would be a a great thing to do. I think that would be a you know, check it out. These are my favorite flowers. Yeah. Maybe you'll like them too. We're not yet at the flower stage, but to anyone in the uh, corporate world that is listening, we are seeking sponsorship. We are seeking endorsements and we will give away things and sell our souls to do so. So it's early stages <laughs> of the industry. There's cowboys everywhere. Why can't we be them too? Touche. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So Our first real segment today allows us to get anything off of our chest. Maybe it's something we've been annoyed about, something we're excited about, or just a random thought that we've had lately. Paul, do you have a hot toke? I do have a hot toke. It might be more of a cry for help uh, than anything else, but my hot toke this week is tolerance breaks are hard but necessary. And the reason I say that is because I really struggle to do them. I have hit this point where I do these kind of I'm going to call them crap tolerance breaks where I stop consuming THC, but I maintain CBD. And I'm not sure that I'm getting, you know, the full effects of a tolerance break when that happens. And I'm also not doing it for as long as I should. You know, my understanding of these tea breaks is they should be 14 to 21 days and you should be a good boy. But, you know, my tolerance is getting out of hand. Um, You know, I'm not yet at the point where I think that I'm abusing my medication, but it's becoming expensive and unproductive at times. So, I'm really keen to hear from listeners this week. My, uh, As I said, my hot toke is more of a cry for help. How do people do their tolerance breaks? You know, that's what I really, really want to know from people. And if you're going to be so bold to submit a hot toke of your own to our respective email addresses, let me know how you do it. Maybe you've got some suggestions for me, Christina. Maybe the listeners do, but I'm all ears. Oh, it's a shameless plug. You don't know it because you haven't heard it yet, but my first podcast for this month, which will go the Thursday before this one airs, is all about tolerance breaks. And I do a, I, I'll own it. I only do three days and I don't stop the CBD, but there's a three day kind of play by play where I'm like checking in throughout the day, talking to you about how I feel, what's going on, like my thoughts and all of that. And so it's, it's a little chaotic. It's a little, 
I had to cut it a little bit in the sense that I'm doing a lot of, gee, what was I thinking? Putting these goodie bags together. Because <laughs> I, I intentionally did it because I think one of the biggest tips I can give you without giving away my whole show that obviously you're going to listen to is keeping yourself busy. So I intentionally did it when I was going to be doing these goodie bags because I knew I have something to keep me busy, something to keep me on task, something to keep me, you know, doing what I need to be doing as opposed to, you know, like, oh, I'm just going to take this break and see how it goes kind of yeah. thing. But yeah, I, I had to cut some of the stuff out. This is, yeah, there was a lot. I think at one point there's a solid, there was a solid 10 minutes of me going, oh my God, like guys, <laughs> what was I, I know it sounded like a great idea, but it really wasn't. And oh God, I got a hand cramp. It, but so yeah, I think they're necessary. I can own it. I think I can do them probably more often than what I do. But I, I think um, at the end of the day, whatever your tolerance break is per se, don't hate yourself for however you can achieve it. And I think that's the most important thing out of out of a tolerate a tolerance break in general. Yeah, maybe I need to pat myself on the back a little bit for the fact I'm even you know considering how to make it more effective because it's not that like if I go away and I don't have access to cannabis, no problem. Like if it's not there, not a worry. If I have it available, I know that it's going to improve things. Generally speaking, you know, I'm either going to calm down or I might, you know, get a little bit more energy, whatever it might be. It's going to improve things, generally speaking. So if it's not there, no worries. You know, sometimes if I'm on a holiday, maybe a bit of alcohol sneaks in. You know, you're, you're in Mexico and while you should have access to cannabis, you don't. You end up having a few more Coronas. That's all right. But um, it's it's I want to be able to sit at home with a full array of my medical regime and just take a few days off with still with those jars staring right at me. I hear you. Like I went through a stage in my life where I was very much uh, smoking if you got it. Yeah. Right. Like if I, if I had an eighth, that eighth would last me all week. Yeah. But if I had an ounce, that ounce would yes. last me all week. Yes. Right. Like smoke it if you got it kind of thing. But I've also noticed over the years I somehow managed to self-correct myself and I always seem to go back to about a gram, a gram and a half a day, regardless of what THC content it is, any, any of that, like pure, like just weight of what I consume above a gram, gram and a half, right? Like, and I think that that is just years of consumption and years of, you know, taking a step back, reassessing, stepping back in. Yeah, there are times when you get carried away that you do have to kind of s step back. Like I said, I there's nothing wrong with the smoke it if you got it, <laughs> but at some point you do have to ask yourself how deep are my pockets. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, less of a hot toke and more of a, a, a plea for help. But um, that's where I'm standing this month. Christina, what's your hot toke? I'm planning a party. Ooh. And when I say I'm planning a party, I actually mean I'm planning a party in collaboration with somebody else. Um, friendly Aussie Buds, uh, Yosef yeah, Yosef. and I. Yep. Shout out. We, I can't give away too, too much right now. All I can tell you is that it will be in Southeast Queensland. It will be next month being April. Uh, it will be the 20th. Oh, what's of special April. about that day? Um, good weather, munchies, live music, and grass. Hell yeah, that sounds fantastic. I'm a little bit uh, envious. Very rare occasion that I'm envious that I don't live in Queensland. Uh, but on this occasion, <laughs> I am very jealous. It's going to be good times. <laughs> so, you know, shameless plug for both of us. Hit the um, Instagram follow because I'm pretty sure that's where we're going to slowly start leaking the information out. Very, very cool. Well, I'm excited for that party. I'm not sure what I'm doing for 420 down here yet. I do know that our annual 420 protest actually has a permit this year. So the police presence might be a little bit less intimidating, but only time will tell. And I will be experiencing that firsthand and I will report back. So I think we're going to have very different 420s in terms of the amount of tension involved, but uh, important events nonetheless. Exactly. Important events, nonetheless. <laughs> so listeners, if you've got a hot toke of your own, please get in touch with giveandtoke at gmail.com or ozcannareviews at gmail.com. And this month, we're really looking for hot tokes about tolerance breaks. So if you've got any experience, advice, any funny stories from tea breaks of your own, please send those in. 
So moving on to current affairs, let's explore some of the latest stories in cannabis. I'll kick it off with Jeremy Buckingham, who is the legalized cannabis MP in New South Wales. He had an interesting story, an opinion piece in the Daily Telegraph this week on March 6th. So it kicks off with a pretty left field story about mob violence in New South Wales, but this is pretty quickly spun into this stance on the importance of legalizing cannabis. And, you know, he kind of talks about the bad attitudes at the top of New South Wales police and the history of prohibition. And what I really liked about this article is that he's taking a law and order angle. And I think this is really interesting because I think over the last couple of years, the Australian cannabis conversation has become about a health issue, you know, public health, you know, how people can benefit from this, how we're, you know, criminalizing people that shouldn't. But I think he might be onto something here with this law and order because I think it taps into a section of the voting public who maybe don't care about the health aspects of cannabis nor the, you know, criminalization of personal possession. But if you go into this law and order argument where it's like, hey, you know, we need to put crime gangs out of business. We need to stop funding organized crime. I think that might actually be really effective, particularly in a state like New South Wales. You know, I don't want to overgeneralize the positions of the states, but I'd say fairly certainly that New South Wales is a little more, bit more politically conservative and the police have a kind of harsher reputation they do certainly down here in Victoria. So very unironically, Buckingham goes into how this legalizing cannabis could be a solution to eliminating some organized crime. And I'm interested to see if that call to action works. I think he's right though. Like again, as a Canadian looking at crime stats and everything else. Yeah, it's okay. I don't want to downplay the ability to grow cannabis, I don't want to do that at all. But what I am going to say is as far as money for illegal activities, that is something that's really easy to do. You set up, you grow your plants, you cut them down, you dry them, you bag them, you tag them, you sell them, and you do it again. It's really easy and it's cash. It's it's burn and turn, burn and turn, burn and turn. And so if you can, and this was one of Trudeau's platforms when he ran, he was like, literally like, if we can take the money out of criminals' hands than we do. We 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 slow them down. We cut back on crime, right? And now you look at all of these places where it has happened, and what do you know? Crime has come down. Some Canadians in the early days of legalization looked at the fact that it didn't instantly destroy organized crime, nor you know destroy the black or legacy markets, and that's because of Canada's long-standing culture. Like here in Australia, we don't have this beautiful attachment culture to cannabis. You know, people in the hinterlands and Byron Bay might argue differently, and, and Nimbin, etc. I'd say that's a very geographical culture related to cannabis if you live in those areas. But overall, in Australia, we don't have that same kind of connection. So we really are trying to put sketchy dudes out of business. You know, there are beautiful growers in the beautiful areas of Vancouver Island and so on. Yeah, I don't want those guys to go out of business and they've suffered from legalization. But that's not a situation we've got here in Australia. I'd have to agree. I'd have to agree. Like, again, Maybe I was just spoiled with with what I was getting before legalization happened. But for real, I had never experienced, what is it, a plant growth regulator, PGR. I'd never experienced yeah. that until I got here. Yeah. And I don't want to be like, hey, that's a big red flag that your plant is being grown for profit and not for love, but it kind of is. And so if we were progressive and we legalized and we really capitalized, and you'll hear me say this all the time, it's an agricultural product. Australia's got amazing agricultural products. I don't understand why we can't just own it and become the best of the best at growing cannabis. A hundred percent. We've we've got all this land and we've got these great conditions. Why not harness that? We've got this reputation around the world for our for other agricultural products. Let's make cannabis one of them. I agree wholeheartedly. There's actually a word for it, and it's a French word, and I'm so gonna say it wrong, but it's ter ter terroir. Terroir. Oh, terroir. Ter there you go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That, that's basically that your phenotype is affected by your environment, right? And we have a great growing environment here, so we should capitalize on it. Hell yeah. What uh, news stories grabbed your attention this week? Germany. Mm-hmm. Legalizing recreational yes. cannabis, April 1st this year. Very, very cool. Well, you know, very cool in a broad sense. Uh, what's your take on the whole thing? 
Um, it's interesting. I think my biggest, so, you know, you can have, what is it? 25 grams in public, 50 grams at home, three plants per household. And you can smoke in some public places. Like, obviously you can't do it at schools and churches and places like that. Right. Yeah. The thing that I thought was most interesting is that they're not going to necessarily like a corner shop kind of thing, like with what BC and what Canada kind of did. They're doing more of a cannabis social clubs where each of those social clubs are going to have 500 members, right? And so you'll be able to kind of freely trade within your social club, but not beyond that. So they've, they've legalized it, but they haven't really made it. What's the word I'm searching for? Accessible. There you go. Like, yeah, accessible. I don't know why I was overthinking that. (laughs) Accessible. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Sorry. But yeah, so I'm like, it's interesting, you know, because they're in the EU and they're kind of one of the big powerhouses in the EU. So if they do it and they're successful with it, I think it's the beginning of other EU countries kind of following along, if you will. The optimist in me says that this is huge. You know, this is a really positive thing. And overall, I think it's important we remain optimistic. My criticisms of it are the dumb limits on possession because 25 grams it is is okay, but it's not an ounce. It's an not, ounce it's is not even an ounce. It's not even an amount that is is distributed. I hated the way the article described it as twenty five grams or twelve strong joints. Like yes. I'm so sick of reading articles by people who have no idea about cannabis. Like there are so many of us out there who will proofread these articles or be you know. Uh, interviewed for them, just please ask someone who knows about cannabis. But even the possession limits don't add up. Like you can have, was it 50 or 60 grams at home? Whichever. Uh, 50 grams at home. 50 50 grams grams at home. home. If you have three plants, you're probably going to get like 50 to 60 grams out of each plant. So how does that work once you've harvested? And I just think stuff like that's really icky. The fact that it doesn't encourage tourists, I think, there's a positive to that because we see that the Amsterdam culture is plagued by irresponsible tourists. But at the same time, if we're going to do this, we just kind of need to do it. And even the opposition government in Germany have said that if they get into power, they will repeal this and pull that back. So good on the current German government for being brave, you know, because I kind of think about Thailand. Just go for it. Make them work for pulling it back. Let the horse bolt already. But at the same time, you know, I know that five and a half years into Canadian legalization, the personal possession limit is 30 grams, and they still are fighting to change that. So these little decisions they make that they think are protecting people ultimately become really difficult to, to kind of uh, change even five and a half years in. So it will be interesting to see what they do. But um, I wish they had have gone a little bit more uh, harder with their regulations. Me too. Me too. But I do think it is a step in the right direction. It's, you know, we're going forward, not backwards. Going forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of going hard, uh, an article that grabbed my attention this week is from medicalrepublic.com.au, a fistful of dollars, cowboys put cannabis regime at risk. Now, I think outside of medical cannabis driving, this is probably one of the hottest topics in Australia, is the way that the industry is set up. You know, who's doing what? How are the big players operating? What rules and regulations are they flouting? And this is a really, really cool article. It's, you know, it's an in-depth read and I think it was a little bit nerdy. You know, it's probably not for the average civilian. It's a bit more for the industry insiders. But, you know, Steve Jones from the Medical Republic details how there's been a rise in cannabis prescriptions in Australia. It was about 2,500 in 2018 and it's potentially half a million today. You know, that's, that's a huge jump. So he details the kind of conflict of interest arising within the industry of clinics and dispensaries being linked together, which, you know, if you're not advertising that you're vertically integrated, can be a bit, little bit misleading for consumers and patients, which is kind of in contravention with a lot of the rules and regulations that the pharmacy guild have and the expectations they have that, you know, if you go to a doctor, there isn't this conflict of the medicine they're prescribing you, that there's some independence there. But, um, I, you know, something that really stood out to me, and it wasn't the point of the article, but it made me think about our last conversation on the catch up where you spoke about how we're regulating words. You know, this article criticized the use of the word dispensary as a way of businesses advertising that they are in cannabis. And I just kind of, I kind of wonder, like, are we going to run out of words that these places can use? Like, it's really hard for these businesses to operate. And I think that's the least of our worries that they're using words like that. But I do think it's important that they've raised that, you know, there are these conflicts of interest. And for me, as a patient, people have to realize, you know, 
if they are with a clinic that has a linked dispensary, that conflict of interest needs to be declared. But as far as I'm concerned, if that dispensary is giving recommended retail price, there's nothing to worry about. You know, that's the big thing. You know, there are a lot of clinics and there are a lot of people out there charging people more than they should be for their medication for something that's already uh, really expensive. And I think people just need to know what they're in for. It makes me think about New York's model where they actually don't allow vertical integration, where you can't be, you know, two things at once. So there has to be a real separation. And, you know, I think this is a bit of a hot toke, but I'm going to go for it. Despite the fact that I will remain a medical patient when adult use comes to be in Australia in whatever form, I think the medical industry needs to be really careful to stop criticizing recreational users who are potentially coming over to the medical field. The reason I say that is I think almost anyone using cannabis is using it for a therapeutic purpose. This kind of criticism that recreational users are ruining the market, I think it's a small percentage of users you go on reddit and you see a lot of people who yeah maybe taking the piss but a lot of us just want really good health care and that's the most important thing so as the industry kind of fights these cowboys i just want honesty i want integrity and i want people to know what they're in for i gotta agree with you i gotta agree with you because again with our last our last episode i don't believe that censoring words is the way to go i wholeheartedly think that we should be focusing on there does need to be disclosure when your clinic and your dispensary are one and the same. Patients need to realize that just because they're at clinic A doesn't mean that they can't get products B and C. They can. They absolutely can. Right. Clinic A isn't the be all end all. And I unfortunately, this pushes you into black market behavior in the sense that you're shopping around. Right. You have to because ultimately there are clinics that are burning and turning. And I think that that's what the TGA and those are the regulations. Like, that's what we need to be looking at. You can't tell me that I'm getting good health care when my doctor literally talks to me for less than 10 minutes. Yes. Yes. There's no way you know what's going on with me, whether it's my cannabis doctor or my OBGYN. You cannot talk to me for 10 minutes and tell me that you've ticked all my boxes and we've discussed everything that needs to be discussed. That's bullshit. And I feel like that's gross negligence right there. And you do, you see stuff like that on, on, on Reddit and other places all the time where, you know, somebody's like, I'm a newbie and my doctor gave me 25% THC. And you want to like reach into the screen and you want to like shake whoever their doctor was and was like, Oh my God, why did you do that? They don't know what they're doing. That is so irresponsible. But yet we're, we're worried about dispensary and plant medicine. Like that seems so bizarre to me. And I, and, and I'm with you too. Yeah. Okay. Who cares? We've got some recreational people that are coming over into the medicinal market. Who cares? This goes back to the whole legalization thing. They're taking money out of the illegal market and they're putting it back into a legal one. Who cares? And I'll tell you right now, I'm with you. The vast majority of us who have been consuming cannabis for any amount of time whether we want to own it or not, are definitely using it in some sort of medicinal form. So stigma be damned, right? Like embrace it. And again, maybe if you talk to patients longer than 10 minutes, maybe you would realize, hey, maybe cannabis could help you in this factor and that factor. And maybe if you tried it this way, da, 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 da. Yeah. Well, there was there was a recent launch of a new clinic and, and they're, they're friends of ours and- they've got like a 30 minute initial consult. So what was the reaction on Reddit from half a dozen losers? It's like, oh my God, that's what a waste of money. That's too long. Who needs that? Well, yeah, it's because there are big players out there who are absolutely, you know, within three minutes, you've got 90 grams of cannabis available to you for the month. That is irresponsible. But I think it's naive for us to think that those players aren't going to exist in, a, in an Australian market. And I think we have to stop kind of blaming the consumer trends and look at those big players. Like, you know, if you are with some of those big players where you get free consults, for example, those costs are made up in other areas. There's one particular company starts with D and ends in Ispensed. <laughs> um, they, like I, I just, I would challenge them like very respectfully to tell me how what you are doing is good healthcare. You know, I, I really go... You got free consultations, $150 per 10 grams. But it's not even that though. Like 
they're with this particular place, their products are constantly changing. Yes. Yeah. Right. So if you found something that worked for you, you can't get it again. You're screwed because they're out. of. It's almost like they're just kind of grabbing whatever flowers are available yeah. and throwing them into bags. And I'm, I don't want to hate. I don't want to hate. But I do feel like it's it's irresponsible. Yeah, that's exactly it. Because it's a set price. So there's no variation. And then, yes, you find something that works for you and it's not available next month. And I also find it interesting that on a service like that, things with 30% THC are popping up because we know that basically once you get across 25% THC, it becomes really unstable and it's really hard to kind of consistently get a reading over 25%. So it's not to say it's not out there, but anyone that's advertising, and I've even seen a 40% advertised this week. Oh my God. Yeah, it's, I saw it too. It's straight I was garbage. like, what is that? Yeah. What it, is that? It's just, it's, I would almost go to, as far to say it's not possible for the entirety of the plant to be anywhere near 40%. I concur. But I, I digress. But anyway, you know, like I, I think these are really interesting topics to discuss. And I think it's important that, you know, these big dogs in the industry are, are watched. And I think, you know, a lot of the things they do is affecting some of the smaller players. And I think there are going to be big changes coming to TGA regulations because of these cowboys. And it's really interesting to watch this industry constantly be kind of like shrunk and oppressed and, for good reason, but it's it really seems to be punishing everyone for the actions of some of these big players. Yeah, I agree. It's like the one fail swoop, right? One bad apple and then we're all done. The yep. whole class is yep. being kept in because one kid was naughty. On the topic of fistful of dollars, article out of cannabis, Alternaleaf, NRL jerseys, Dolphins, major sponsorship. Yeah. I'm not against it. Yeah. I got no hate for this at all. I'm not against it. I'm like, well, what's the big deal? Like Forex does it. Kia does it. Chemist's Warehouse does it. McDonald's does it. Like, I don't know. I got no issue with it. Good for them. Like, I, I'm very curious to see if it's going to stick. You know, I think there's a reasonable school of thought that it might just be a bit of a publicity stunt. But at the same time, you know, the Dolphins legal team and Alternatives legal team would have really looked into this before announcing it, unless it is just a pure stunt. Because, you know, we are in this TGA world of, of not being allowed to advertise. So how are Alternative putting their name on this jersey? Mm, that's a good question. I could see it being more of a joke if it was like April 20th yeah. kind of thing, <laughs> for sure. I would assume that their legal team has done their their due diligence in it. Again, 4X is an alcohol company and they, they, they sponsor. So again, I don't have anything against it. I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean... From the picture that was included in the article, it's just underneath the V-neck there at the front. I wouldn't say it was very flashy per se, but I guess if the guy's standing there talking on camera, it is right there front and center. But I'm not opposed to it. I'm very torn about this one because I think there's a very reasonable libertarian argument where we're too far down the path with gambling, booze, junk food. Like, you know, I remember when... Like I loved cricket as, you know, as a younger guy and the Victorian Bush Rangers got sponsored by KFC and I just could not wear that jersey. Like, you know, giant KFC on the front, both sleeves on the back. Like it was more KFC than sports team. And I didn't feel comfortable with that. You know, that was just a personal decision. And I think adults are allowed to make personal decisions. But I don't, you know, want to drop the old, like, somebody please think of the children. But, you know, I do think the adults in the room need to make good decisions about sponsorship in general. You know, there was an Australian study in 2013 where five to 12 year olds found that they associated team sports with the products mentioned by sponsors. And 10 to 14 year olds found that they think food and drink companies that sponsor their club are cool. And they even want to return the favor by buying their products. So there is a lot of influence available. Now that's when you then go, well, what is cannabis in this regard? If it is a pharmaceutical product that is healing people, well, then we should be promoting that because there are people under 18 that are able to use cannabis therapeutically. I think what I would like to see is a, it's like the cannabis packaging in Canada. It's really upsetting seeing that plain packaging when, you know, craft beers have, you know, things that are stealing intellectual property that are really like fancy, really colorful, really pretty. Like the amount of craft beers I've bought just because the logo looks cool, you know, I can't even count. So I think it's upsetting and unfair that cannabis companies can't advertise the way the booze companies can when they're allowed to do that. I would be going down the route of, I think we need to evaluate advertising in general. With that being said, 
these sports teams need sponsors. These stadiums need sponsors. That is an integral part of running their team. So I've found it really hard to have a take on this one because I think there's really interesting arguments on both sides. I would say generally I'm fine with it, but I think there's a, an interesting new precedent about to be set here and an interesting social conversation. I, I think what I find most interesting out of it is, in theory, it's it's still a banned substance in the NRL. Ah, We're not talking yeah, the right. NBA, like the NBA, National Basketball Association in the States. It's no longer a banned substance. They're no longer... Um, Let's thank COVID-19 for that. They, they realized going to the bubble, these guys were going to need some cannabis. <laughs> right. But, but like, I guess, like I said, I'm not opposed to it, but, but my thing was just, again, the NBA, they're not testing for it. So if an American company, uh, cookies, cookies wanted to sponsor, you know, the Lakers, I'm like, okay, I could kind of see that if you will, even though yeah. the colors are off and all that jazz, but that's not <laughs> important here. What's important is, is that, the NRL, it's still a banned substance, right? They're still against it. So it's interesting to, I, to me personally that a, a sports team would allow sponsorship from something that technically is illegal for their players. Alcohol is not. It's not illegal to drive a Kia. It's not illegal to have KFC. You know what I mean? Like all of this money that's coming into them is not a big deal. However, if one of their players was an alternative leaf patient. I'd love to hear, you know, every time there's a lot of outspoken people in the NRL, you know, there's a broad array of bad opinions amongst some of the players in that league. Uh, I'm not just saying that because I'm a Victorian, you know, you what anyone who watches the news is just like, Oh fuck. What's, what's someone in the NRL done or said this week? Like, I don't know, follow the Batuta advocate. That's probably the best uh, actual news source for the NRL. But you know, like they have so much to say about pride round and things like that. There's players out there who are against that. I'd love someone to speak up and say they're against cannabis because honestly, I just think this is great for the conversation. You know, I do think long-term, if I had my way, we would really restrict all forms of advertising thinking about the influence because as the adults, we do need to think about the impact that it has. Like I have definitely been influenced by advertising. Like, you know, KFC is a great example. I've watched the cricket, not had KFC for three years. And then like after a game being like, geez, I feel like some KFC because every ad break has KFC. You know, the shirts have it on there. I bought a Hisense TV because we had Hisense Arena in Melbourne. I'm like, well, that must be a trustworthy brand then. You know, like- It's funny how that works. It's so true. It's yeah. so, it is so 100% true. So I guess maybe if I could have a perfect world, we would restrict a lot of forms of advertising and maybe the form of cannabis advertising would be like those got milk ads or the lamb ads where it's just a general industry body being like, got cannabis. <laughs> I'm okay with that though. I'm okay with that though, right? Like I said, at the end of the day, I'm not opposed to to sponsorship for for sports teams. I agree with you. Sports, you've got to get money from somewhere, you know, whether it's a a big team, a small team, a farm league, whatever it is. I just think it's interesting that, you know, again, a particular clinic that provides us a, a a service for a particular substance that if somebody within that organization took a drug test and failed, I don't know, man, are you going to be sitting on the bench because of it? Yeah, this is a real watch this space. It's a fascinating conversation. I don't think there's a right answer to it yet, um, but we will continue to watch and see. I mean, we'll we'll see if it even goes ahead. Like, again, it, it the legal side of things must be all right. I guess if their legal things are fine right now, it's going to be interesting to see how the TGA responds and then changes the laws again. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, totally. Watch the space. Watch the space. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's a bit of a roundup of some of the things that got our attention. This is a very active space, this industry, and there's so many amazing stories. There was a wonderful one about cannabis and melanoma from the ABC just this week. So we encourage people to stay active with the news because there's always something happening. So moving on. If listeners haven't visited Oz Canner Reviews yet, make sure you check out the Substack page available in the links in the show notes below. Christina, what can your readers expect this month on Oz Canner Reviews? March is all about CBD and balanced flowers. So I'm reviewing my first CBD flower. I've got um, another balanced flower. I'm talking about a CBD nano emulsion. Right on. Yeah, man. CBD, CBD, CBD. 
It sounds fun. I'm a big fan of the balanced flowers, particularly in the, you know, quote unquote sativa realm. Those generally don't agree with me as they're a little bit too stimulating, but those that are, you know, much lighter on the THC level and balanced out by CBD seem to work really well for me. So I, I loved your mango haze review. That's um, a favorite of mine back from when I lived in Canada. So it's nice that we have it available here and I find it really effective for my daytime. And this is one of those great things about cannabis. It's different for everyone. I know that you didn't get the same effects. Oh, you know what? I, it was a beautiful flower. And I was blown away at just how enjoyable it was to vape. Like it really was like, I was like, whoa, look at these clouds. And it's just, it's very flavorful. And it's, and yeah, again, nice you tropical open that, taste. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, but it just, it just didn't quite hit the mark for me. And I think that's why I said at the end, you know, if, if the THC and CBD percentage had been switched, I think it would have been more, more my speed, right? You know, you do have to kind of adjust a bit to what a CBD flower is, right? Especially if you're somebody that's, again, coming from the black market. I mean, like who the, who the fuck were you? Oh. Hey buddy, I'd like some CBD. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be like, say what? And so like, it, it took a bit for me to kind of sit with it to be like, okay, this is, this is the feeling. And I got to stop chasing what I think the feeling should be. Yeah, right. Right. So, you know, there, there's been a been an adjustment here over this these last few weeks of you know bringing the THC percentage down, doing a tea break, introducing those CBD flowers. It's been nice. It's been different, right? It'll be interesting as I come out next month as I slowly start to bring the THC back up to kind of like my happy spot, which is seventeen to twenty three. It'll be interesting to see you know what it's like when I go back to that twenty three percent. If I'm like, ooh, okay. This is not on my butt a little bit more than what it has a few months ago kind of thing. So I'm excited. March. Good stuff. I think it's good for people to hear like, you know, you and I are experienced consumers and we've exp we've consumed in various settings in various places across the world. And there's still trial and error. There's still like reflection required. It, it do you don't ever get to like just a perfect sweet spot. My regime is perfect. I'm never going to need to change it. Because of, you know, so many factors, our expectations change, our needs change. You know, there was one product I got a few months ago where the first few times I smoked it, it made me absolutely silly. It made me useless for 45 minutes. Now it's an important part of my regime because now that I've grown accustomed to it, it's actually a really effective like afternoon indica where I need to like calm down but not go to bed. And so that is that kind of fun or silliness that first manifested is actually now just a little bit of elevation. So, you know, a bit of trial and error required and, and constant reflection. Constant. And, you know, I, not so much now, but originally I used to get a lot of pushback on why do I have so many flowers and why this and why that? And I'm like, yo, at the end of the day, every day is different. My needs change every day. And I need those flowers to change with me with what I need. You know, like some days you get up and you want a bouquet of bright red, super fragrant red roses. And other days you're like, oh my God, that stinks. Like get that the hell away from me. And you want some low key white uneventful roses, you know, like the day changes and you need different things. And so different flowers offer different things. And I think it's important to be able to rotate different, different products. Right. And they, like you're saying, your tolerance also changes what works for you three months ago, your tolerance changes and maybe it's not as effective for you or like what you were saying, you've hit that zone with it and you realize now this does really work for me in this time slot, right? It's, it's a constant sit with it, reflect and really think about what you need and what you're getting. And that's why I'll stay a medical patient even when we have an adult use market because I think it's really important for me to reflect and be forced to reflect what really works for me and when. Conversely, I also love when I can just go pick up a pre-roll of something fancy and new that's a bit of fun and have that. So when we get to that stage of adult use market, I'll still be using both because I think that they require separate parts of your brain. Again, different needs for different times, right? Different for strokes sure. for different blokes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ashley, you're coming to the end of the show. Is there anything else that you want to talk about, Paul? Yes, there is only one thing I want to remind the listener about, and that, again, is if you have a hot tote for us, please send it in to ozcannareviews at gmail.com 
or giveandtoke at gmail.com. Record it on your voice memo app. Keep it to under a minute. And this month, we're really looking for if people have feedback about tolerance breaks, either how you've done it, how you've struggled with it, any advice you've had, even any queries you might have. You, this might be the first time you've heard of tolerance breaks. So please get in touch with us. Send us a hot toke so that we can share it on next month's show. Well, that's it for this episode. You can find me at Oz Canner Reviews on Substack, Instagram, and Twitter or X. You can find me on all the usual places. My preferred spot is Instagram at Give and Toke. We've also given you the email address and all relevant links will be in the show notes below. So get in touch with either of us. Let us know what you think about the show. Let us know what you want to hear more of or less of, and then we will act accordingly. We will indeed. And always, if you like what you hear, be sure to hit the subscribe button, give us a five-star rating or review, and of course, tell a friend. I'm Christina. And I'm Paul. Thanks for listening.